Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining our Synergy webinar series where we designed the next hour to share case studies using complementary techniques that kind of examines battery design and manufacturing from different angles. Today our webinar title is Analysis Techniques for Modern Battery Design and Manufacturing. With me are your speakers, Dr. Sergei Mamadov, our Raman and XRF application scientist, and Dr. Jeff Bodicom, our product line manager for Particle Characterization Group. Um, between Sergey and Jeff, I bet they have more than 50 or 60 years of experience looking at particles and materials, so you're in good hands today. My name is Julie Chen Yuen. I will be facilitating, and we will have a Q&A session in the end. Okay, so let's pass the ball to our first speakers, Dr. Mamadov. All right, uh, let's get started. I'm going to talk today on a basic of Hamann spectroscopy because it's a popular technique. However, we need to really understand a little bit features because we're working with a very uh, interesting material and very sensitive materials to light. Uh, and can, I can talk a little bit about the Raman spectroscopy of mixed oxide, uh, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. I'll give you a few examples of what kind of other technique we can use it, and a few examples of uh, chemical analysis of lithium ion batteries, uh, which we did it. And I show several examples of this very interesting technique, micro XRF, and how we can apply this micro XRF technology in lithium battery industry. So let's talk a little bit about the Raman effect. What is the Raman effect? So as you know, the, when it's uh, light it hits the molecules, uh, it's scattered. So we're looking on the blue sky and see it's really scattering the blue due to the fact that the blue light is scattered much stronger than red one. So, so it's, it's scattering can increase with the force power and frequency, and it's more efficient with the short wavelengths. However, there is also possibility that the incident photon, uh, photon interact with the molecules and in this case molecules may gain a lost energy so the scattered photons have the shifted frequency or shifted energy so which is called the inelastic scattering and the Raman scattering and up here this is a diagram which I show about the Rayleigh so in the Rayleigh scattering we don't have any change in the frequency as it going to the virtual state and going to the back and in the stock scattering so uh, uh, we excited the molecules and getting this light which is slightly less energy and they're looking for the redshift and for the anti-stock scattering it's the opposite we excited the energy and getting slightly and the energy of forms, photons is gained from the molecules and we have the blue shift of course the probability are different and mostly important for us is stock shift and in this case, when you're doing the Raman spectroscopy, we always, we're always mostly looking for the stock shift. Now, here is that kind of the cartoon, how it works. Besides of this, this is a simple diagram like stocks, relay, anti-stocks, scattering. We have a little bit uh, different complication due to, the, uh, due to the band gap of the material. So in the Raman scattering, if we see for this diagram, we're going to the virtual state. So if it's this classical uh, uh, Raman scattering, we're going something between the gap. However, if we have this laser, uh, which is really very really close to the gap, we may have the pre-resonance Raman scattering. And if it's energy of a laser excitation is larger than the gap of the material, we have the resonance Raman scattering. And this is, becomes an important issue uh, in uh, when you study some materials, and I'll show some example later. Now, what Raman effect is absorbed? So we absorb this laser energy changes as excited molecules vibrate. The reason is as very simple. We're looking for the energy change. Depending on the wavelengths, uh, you're getting the different shift. However, the energy change will be the same. Here is an example of spectrum from aspirin taken with a blue, green. And red laser. As you may see, if I show you a spectrum on this scale, uh, you don't think you can consider this as the same material. However, if I plot it as a Raman shift, you clearly see this absolutely uh, as the same material. This is the beauty of the Raman scattering. So your spectrum uh, will not depend on a, a laser excitation. 
except the complication that I show next uh, slide. So you can select your laser based on uh, whatever you want to do. For example, if you want to have the very high uh, uh, scattering, high intensity scattering, so better to move to the blue and green and UV. However, you can select the laser like 785 or 632 if you have some fluorescence problem, but your spectrum will be the same. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of, of a different condition for the, uh, for the material. For example, I take the uh, uh, molysulfide, which has an indirect uh, gap uh, with 123, indirect one. So I take the spectrum with a different laser, 405, 532, 633, and 785. And as you may see, the spectra looks very different. So in the 785 laser, we're going so close to the, uh, mostly the laser resonance condition. And 633, it's almost a resonance condition. This is many different band and excitation phonon electron interaction, something like this. And blue and green looks uh, very similar, except the one band has becomes more intense compared to another one. Now, its material is like really slightly far from the uh, battery business. However, we can take the cobalt oxide. And here is the spectra of the cobalt oxide taken with a different excitation. And even the gap is really very small, uh, we can see really uh, differences in the spectra. Okay, peak position are the same, however, relative intensity are maybe slight, uh, really different. And then another example, how important to see, because this is a material, it's a, it's a bulk material, it's not a powder. But here is it's a, a malachite crystal and this is a powder. So in certain condition, I can get nice crystal of malachite with a 785 laser and 532. But if I will take the powder, I see entire fluorescence. So surface state on, on the small particles create a, a strong photoluminescence. So this is a different effect which may influence on, uh, on the Raman spectra you want to collect it. So before to do something, we need to really select the laser and think about how we can handle the excitation emission spectrum based on uh, knowledge of our material. <clears throat> how this particular data I can show uh, uh, in this presentation, it's all collected on the, our instrument, the Labram Evolution. It's a, a large spectrometer having 800 millimeter focal length. I using only 532 uh, nanometer laser just because many people in 532 it may not, in some cases, the best as efficiency. However, it's just a standard for this measurement. So I use the 600 per meter grating. It's a Synapse CCD from the uh, Horiba 100x objective and a software Alapspec 6 uh, spectroscopy suite. Here's a picture of uh, Labram evolution. So you can see here there is this uh, instrument itself and equipped with a microscope, uh, dual scan, uh, binocular second camera, one camera under the knees and a mapping stage. Now, as you can see, this is upright microscope. So in upright microscope, we're moving the sample up and down using the stage up here. However, uh, the more popular version for the, for the uh, battery application, it's, it's uh, open microscope. Here's a picture of open microscope on the system. As you can see here, this is the turret, and turret moving up and down the stage in the certain rigid position. The advantage of this stage is you can put it any size of the sample to the needs of the microscope. And this is really big advantages. So in particular project I will show you, I using the several features of the our LAPSEC suite software. One of them is the view sharp. I'll show some example. It's allowed you to create this stack uh, of the uh, images and bring all your sample, which might be not really in the uh, focal plane or particles because it's maybe not really plane. And NAF sharp, this feature is allowed you to focus it on the large uh, or a low magnification objective on the sample and then switch to the high magnification objective and field of view uh, low magnification objective, which is large, several millimeters maybe, and using 100 microns, uh, 100 uh, X objective to move the sample very closely. The multi point analysis, which allowed you to collect on your sample, set it up in such a way that you can say the points and software will remember coordinates in X, Y, and Z. The very uh, useful feature as well is a particle finder. So you can bring this optical image uh, to the software, run this particle finder application and select particle what you need it. For example, you want to sort it out by the size, by the area, and a software will find it. And then 
as this particle will be measured in, in a different condition. And also the multivariant analysis, which allowed us to really extract information from the spectral image. So spectral image is a, is a set, for example, from the mapping data for each point has its coordinate and the spectrum. And when we collected the map or multipoint, we can apply multivariant analysis to extract this useful information. Now, let me show you what the sharpest does. So this is my optical image taken with a, a, a hundred-deck objective. As you can see, some particles are blurry, some particles are really in focus. When I uh, using the view sharp, view sharp creates a Z stack. And in this case, uh, it's bring entire image in a very sharp uh, condition. So now the good things about the view sharp is that also I can create the topology of the sample. Here is the topology of the sample. So X, Y, Z, we know this, but X, uh, Z may use it in future to do the measurements of the Raman spectra. So I can use a view sharp as Z profile and assign it each point with a Z and software will do automatically focusing for particular Z profile. So this is a very useful feature for the powder uh, and uh, other things we could do the multi-point measurements or mapping uh, uh, using this a view sharp features the topology of Z profile as an autofocus function. Now another interesting feature which is really uh, may help to measure different thumb. It's, it's an actual example of the measurements uh, of the anode. Uh, it's uh, how you can select the particles. You don't want to focus it to one particle or naked one. So what you can do, you can do the either particle finder or multipoint or do the map. So this example of multipoint, so we selected the points and assign the measurements for each point. And in this case, we do the measurements uh, in, in automated mode. So I just to click it, click it, click it, and say, here is my points. So up here is like oh, almost 40 points. And software will do automatically and collect entire spectral image. And then you can pull it out from this uh, spectral image, spec of each particular particles, and analyze it if you really want to do it or do it batch analysis using the uh, multivariant analysis model. So this is very interesting and very important feature when you do the measurements on such materials as a, uh, for the lithium batteries. Now let's look for the uh, for the material which is, you can get it from the different vendors. And this is NMC111. It's a nickel, cobalt, and manganese. A nickel oxide is not really Raman active. It should not be Raman active as a crystal due to the symmetry. But when you uh, slightly disturb the lattice using the different cobalt and manganese, it becomes a Raman, uh, all the mixture becomes a Raman active. And here's an example of the uh, NMC111 uh, from different vendor. I call the vendor one and vendor two. As you can see, uh, uh, the particles looks different. This is a large particle. This is another one, the smallest one. Now, the mostly interesting for us to see how reproducible property of the Raman property of this particle. So here the spectra take it with the different three spots. And then you see the spectra are really uh, uh, very similar to each to other. So statistically, uh, the spectrum we can collect it, it's, it's very good reproducible. On the vendor two, which is really optically looks different, we still see the certain uh, particles which are smaller. However, spectra is also very reproducible, slightly different. However, it's slightly different. What we're going to do now, we can look how the, what is the influence of the power of the laser uh, on these different particles. So if you are putting the really very low power, 532 laser is point, uh, almost 0.2 milliwatts. Here is this, my spectra becomes a very sharp and, and, and a 593 band. If I put it 1 milliwatt, 1.2 milliwatts, I'm getting really broad spectrum. So I see really very uh, strong influence of the laser power on the Raman spectrum. How reproducible? What happens if I uh, reduce the power or drop the power? Now, uh, this is for the, uh, in other particles, and you can see it becomes the same trend as a vendor one. And if I using after that, it's the same point, low power, spectrum is not returned to the previous. So you create by laser power some irreversible changes in the material. And so the, this is very important to understand for this material, which is a dark and absorption is very high. This uh, low power uh, allowed you to collect a real Raman spectrum. When you see the broadening of the line, it means you already heat it up. So in the, in the some uh, cases, so this is NMC, uh, NCM materials, 
you have to use a power less than uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 milliwatts to get the real good spectrum. And I'll show later on because some irreversible changes in a material due to this uh, cycling uh, of lithium can create also different things and we don't need to mix it up effect of a laser power and effect of the uh, non-reversibility of the lithium transfer. This is Ramos spectroscopy of the NCM811. So here, see, you see here the spectrum is, looks like very similar in three points. And again, it's a strong influence of, of laser power. As you can see, the, in the low power, we have the very good band. Once we increase the power for 1.2, uh, almost 10 times, we're getting like really broad band. And it's broad band when you're starting to do the same point is not returning to the original position. It's still below and still getting uh, really broad. What kind of instrumentation or how you can do the lithium uh, uh, battery measurements in, in the Ramos spectroscopy? Here's actually a picture of this cell. Uh, you can use it for the uh, measurement. And it's a picture of actual cell under the microscope. As you can see, exactly this is a cell. <clears throat> and we're using the usually uh, long working distance objective. Be sure you're coming through this window. So this window. You may use a different instrumentation. I using the Labram Evolution. However, I did a several project with the Labram Evol uh, with La uh, Explorer Plus. It depending on the requirement on the laser, on the spectral resolution, whatever you wanted, and other par parameters. Now let's look for the lithium uh, cobalt uh, uh, oxide. So this is a crystalline structure. So we're looking for the lithium, which is red, and in if you have the reversible charge discharge, we're going to this from the lithium cobalt O2 with slightly deficient uh, crystalline structure. However, this is maybe not reversible process. And in this case, we're getting like, let's say decomposition of the lithium cobalt oxide or cobalt oxide or lithium oxide. So there's a certain kind of the influence in spectrum uh, should be. However, this particular material lithium deficient cobalt oxide, it also has a different Raman spectra because Raman spectra is very sensitive to the crystalline structure. And here's the spectrum. So this is lithium cobalt oxide and this is deficient. So in deficient, we see the certain shift of the band like 477 shift for this, 465 and 487, 587, 577. And in addition, we have 638 band. Now, because in the, in, the, in the cathode, we have also the carbon, we have the carbon spectra. This three spectra can be used as a, as a reference spectra when we're getting the map of this area and want to decompose and see the chemical distribution of our original lithium cobalt oxide, deficient lithium uh, cobalt oxide and the carbon. And here is a, a picture. So this is lithium cobalt oxide. This is a carbon and a deficient lithium cobalt oxide. To do the decomposition of this material, I use the uh, MVA plus. It's a, a chemometric package which is integrated to the uh, lab spec six. So you can really use very easily and visualize what happens is here. On this picture, I just overlay colors and you can see here this deficient part of the uh, lithium oxide. And the red is, is a lithium uh, cobalt oxide and the green is a carbon. So this, you can see the distribution and you can clearly see what may happen to this. So the next example, if it's a carbon-based anode, so we need to see a little bit and I remind you uh, about the carbon. So in the carbon business, there is a band from the diamond, we don't consider this anymore. And there is a defect band and there is a geographic band. So this is like a reference for different uh, band assignment and the typolarization ratio. And this is like a reference on, on a, a journal. Now, when you do the uh, carbon-based anode, we also have to see the different form of carbon which present in the, uh, in the anode. So and here is an example of decomposition of this map uh, for the three different form of carbon. And you can see here is a really uh, uh, G band, a DG band, and some other amorphous bands uh, along with this one. Now, it's very important for the uh, carbon-based anode to keep certain ratio between uh, D and G band, be sure that the uh, uh, anode is efficient. And this is allowed you also to see the distribution. If you have some channels or you have the random distribution, it gives you some idea how to handle this. But 
Uh, this is an example just to show what we can extract from the uh, Raman map of uh, carbon-based anode. Up here, it's an it's example what I, I, I uh, already mentioned. So we have the NMC cathode, and you can see the spectrum, which is like really uh, EG band, which is really, really low. It's like looks like a shoulder, A1G band, the main band. Now, what we're doing this uh, cycling and looking for the capacity tension ratio, the change in, uh, becomes not really uh, uh, reversible. So in this case, what it happens, it's in the beginning of the uh, uh, cycling, it was the end of the cycle. And you can see the spectra, Raman spectra looks absolutely different. So EG band becomes more pro uh, prominent and uh, uh, AR-G band getting like really low intensity. And this is allowed you to really uh, quantify or uh, let's say to monitor what is the, how many cycles you needed to just to really change this capacity uh, uh, in, uh, of the battery. And Raman spectroscopy can allow you to do it. So next example, it's a, it's a micro XRF. It's a, a really nice technique which allows you to see inside of materials without really opening materials. So we do the transmission detector in our uh, instrument. As you can see here, I'm putting the lithium battery and monitor this as uh, parts and uh, see if it's shorted to you. However, mostly important that you can use a mi micro XRF to detect the contamination of separator. This example shows the contamination of separator by the uh, copper particles, which is create uh, causing short uh, of the circuit, and it is malfunction. And to study this stuff or investigate it, we may use a special uh, transfer vessel, which allows you to put in your materials on the controlled environment in the glove box, and then bring it to the device, which is XGT9000. X-ray fluorescence microscope open up inside and do the measurements in the full vacuum condition. In this case, you are protected against the reaction of your materials with the air because the lithium containing materials uh, are very sensitive to the air. So this is my part is ended up. So I give him to Jeff. Thank you. Okay. So Sergey uh, just talked about measuring about one photon in 10 million. Uh, and so where are the other nine million and so on photons going? Well, that's into scattering. And I'm going to primarily talk about laser diffraction for determining particle size. Uh, and, and so laser diffraction is uh, classical Rayleigh scattering. We're really looking at the scattering as a function of angle to determine particle size and size distribution. Uh, it, it, it's fun because first, it's very fast, we get lots more photons than Sergey does, and very repeatable. It works well for powders and suspensions, and it's probably the most common technique in particle characterization, and really dominates what we've seen for battery material analysis. I'll mention a couple other up-and-coming techniques at the very end, in case that sparks discussion. So, and this is implemented in our Hariba LA960 laser diffraction particle size analyzer. Well, probably a poor slide for this audience, but when you you take a, a battery out and you look at it, well, it's, it's just a solid brick or cylinder. And, you know, what? why are we looking at talking about particles? And, and as you just saw with a, a bunch of the micrographs, uh, these battery anodes and cathodes are made up of particulate materials. So here I have some micrographs from inside a lithium ion battery. And I see materials at six microns, 20 microns, it can go down from there. And then next question is, well, why do we worry about particle size? And we kind of got into earlier, uh, you're going to have an anode and a cathode, and you'll have chemistry that sets your potential, your voltage. And then as you apply a load, you're going to see voltage drops due to internal resistance, uh, both electrical, which I'll ignore, and ionic. And so zooming way in to lithium cobalt oxide, we have these octahedral slabs and lithium ions in between them. And the name of the game is how fast can I move the lithium in and out of there as I discharge and charge the battery. So as I think about this, I say, well, gee, if I have a very large particle, 
I don't have all that much edge to work with, and so I don't have a lot of surface area or specific surface area to move the ions in and out. Well, great, I make them as small as possible, but there are a couple of things that happen. Uh, the first is that as uh, this area goes up, you have undesirable side reactions that those can also rise, and you will you will have different mechanical behavior. And what it all boils down to is as you are developing and manufacturing batteries, you'll want to know the particle size of the powders that, that you're testing and then the ones you're using for your actual manufacturing. So if you step back uh, a little bit in battery technology, uh, I mentioned an alkaline battery. I mentioned that just to point out that these the questions have been coming up for a long time, uh, where you'll have a can, a graphite layer, manganese oxide, a separator and a zinc anode and a current collector. Well, the graphite particle size, does that matter? Uh, well, I can lower resistivity uh, by making my particles smaller, but I also lower flex strength. So there's going to be a kind of a mechanical versus electrical trade-off there. And the D90s are kind of the largest particles we see in a system range for about 10 to 100 microns, which is something we can readily measure by laser diffraction, which I will get to shortly. And manganese oxide, uh, which can be analyzed either by microscopy or laser diffraction, gelling to hundreds of microns. The zinc anode, hey, that's a powder, 50 to 200 microns in a gel. And so behavior of even this relatively older technology relies on these particle and, and the particle size distribution. And that applies as we move into modern, newer battery types, uh, the lithium batteries and so on. So here's some example data. Uh, this is uh, graphite uh, dispersed in water uh, with a little bit of tween 20 or surfactant in order to, uh, to wet the surfaces. Graphite doesn't always love water. Uh, we apply 10 minutes of ultrasonic power and that's to break up the loose agglomerates D50 about three microns, D90 about six microns. So not a real wide size distribution. And that's uh, probably good news for this manufacturer. This size range, we're getting down around three microns. Uh, as you do imaging, your resolution limit for classical imaging is about half a micron. And so we're getting down to where you're not really getting any shape information anyway. And so this material is a little on the small side for imaging. It certainly is on the large side for dynamic light scattering. And so laser diffraction in the LA960 is really the technique of choice for this. Moving on in materials, uh, this is zinc powder. Uh, we can measure it as a dry powder. And Sergey mentioned uh, concerns about reactivity with air. So if you have lithium compounds and, and you don't want to disperse them in water uh, and you can run them as dry powders, that's that can be an option. Uh, but these are zinc powders, much larger materials, about 180 microns. And you can see very closely grouped size results, 182, 181, 180 microns. Uh, the standard deviation listed here is due to the width of the distribution peak. Moving to newer materials, manganese oxide. Yep, laser diffraction works as well in uh, for these materials, this is an overlay of two size distributions. So I have the differential distribution that is showing as a peak with the peak's value uh, 190, about 80 microns. And then the backwards S shape is a cumulative distribution, which tells me the vast majority of the particles are smaller than say 200 microns. Lithium cobalt oxide. Now we're getting into five different lots of material. That's a much more practical question than measuring it once or twice. Uh, and I report out the median size for each of these five lots, ranging from about 12 and a half microns down to 11.3 microns. I can't comment much on whether that variation was acceptable to for the manufacturing process, but you can certainly track those sorts of changes mentioned ultrasound in passing. And if you have your particles in a loose agglomerate, 
We want to break that up in order to find kind of your primary particle size. Uh, and, and you would do this with, with a pressure titration where you vary, or an ultrasound titration, where you vary the amount of energy you feed into the system to break up the particles and see, well, how much energy do you use? We'll make a plot where we might look at the blue with, with no ultrasound, and then the light green is after one minute, a little harder to see, so we go from 10.5 to about 10.1 microns. Then at three minutes, we're at 9.7, and five minutes, we're at 9.4. And so you see between three and five minutes, the median particle size, it's not changing all that much as I add energy. And you might decide if I get good repeatability at five minutes, I can go ahead and make the measurement from there. So the LA960 has an onboard ultrasound system. If you're really dumping a lot of energy into your uh, particles to break them up for analysis, you'll probably need an outside ultrasound, ultrasonic system. A lot of the easier materials, though, are, are broken up readily with the, with the onboard ultrasound. Um, this example of some nice tight repeatability, uh, method validation for lithium manganese oxide across multiple days. And I have a median size, uh, the average of five days is a 9.5 micron median, coefficient of variation of 1.9%. So if we go back a couple of slides, I was showing you those five different lots with a variation of about 10%. And so that tells you that a lot of the variation that we were measuring in that earlier series of slides is coming from lot to lot variation. And this repeats on different days is how you get it, uh, variation from measurement to measurement. If I stuff a sample into the instrument, and this is one of the reasons laser diffraction is very popular, uh, and I measure over and over again, I can have an average result of say, in this case was 9.8, microns for lithium manganese oxide, 16.7 for lithium titanate, coefficient variation of 0.9% and 0.5%. So if you're trying to track a process, then you want to make sure that your measurement is fast as you get results in a reasonable amount of time. And we can do that in a couple minutes by diffraction. And then secondly, that you always get the same answer so that when your process changes, you're going to see a change in your analytical results. If the variation in your analysis is wider than your, the amount your process is allowed to vary, then you're really gonna get confused about whether I have variation results or variation in my materials. So this tight repeatability is, is a very good tool for tracking changes in your process. Well, I talked about uh, repeatability a couple times with the same analyzer. Now let's move on and say, you, if you have two different instruments, uh, which might be cited at two different plants, or might be a supplier and a vendor, uh, some supplier and customer sites, are they getting the same answer? And the instrument to instrument variation on the 950 and now the 960s has been very, very tight. So I go from 9.75 to 9.6. So 0.1 on about 10 microns, and 16.7, 16.9, about 0.2 on almost 20 microns. Now, when you start looking at variations between analyzers, you're also going to have tied into that variations between different laboratories and analysis tech and sample preparation techniques. Uh, and so one of these steps that we have to think about, particularly as we uh, think about having multiple analyzers at a, for a single product, at different sites is how well we're transferring not just the instrument but also the methods and i'll give you know for example our uh, repeatability or analyzer analyzer is much tighter for well-behaved standard samples and part of that is because they're well behaved and everybody kind of agrees on how to prepare them and, um, and, and we have robust methods okay so so far, I've talked about fairly routine laser diffraction measurements where we're going to use either air dispersion or dispersion in liquid to break up the particles and to keep them far away. And that's, that can be less exciting if you have a suspension and you have some sort of uh, difference in behavior 
that you can't track for a highly dilute sample. Running samples dilute is, is the easiest way to run the analysis, certainly is the most comforting theoretically, because the math is done around very dilute samples. Now, sometimes, if you dilute a sample too much, your size distribution for both diluted samples looks the same. So I'm looking at sample one versus sample two here. Uh, we see a performance difference. I dilute 1,000 to one. I get the same size distribution out. So whatever I'm doing for dilution is also breaking up whatever is causing uh, my difference in battery performance. So is there a way we can make measurements uh, at low dilutions or no dilution? As you can guess from this slide, the answer is yes. Here's an example with uh, two sample one and sample two. So this is the same material, two different samples with differing uh, performance. And, and this was battery performance, incidentally. We diluted 1,000 to one to make the measurement. That really is the most theoretically comfortable and easiest way to make measurements. And we obtain the same size distribution for both samples, even though they had different performance. Well, that isn't very exciting. It just says, well, I diluted a lot. I probably changed how, whatever is uh, affecting my battery performance. Let's go back and try it at a lower dilution. And the graph on the left is the measured size distribution at low dilution. So here I only dilute four to one. And so you still see the, some of the aggregates that were in the parent suspension. We haven't diluted out so much that they they separate. And this difference in size was eventually traced back to the change in the two the performance of the, of the two slurries. The take home here is sometimes you'll have a high dilution that suppresses interesting aggregation, even though that's the easiest way to make the measurement. So we, we have a high concentration cells for measuring, well, higher concentration liquids. And, and there are two flavors. There's an HL cell, which is really for liquids that you can still kind of move through a syringe, don't have too high a viscosity, and the PACE cell for higher viscosity liquids. As a comment, when you run a very dilute sample uh, in the LA960, when you're done and you want to clean up for the next sample, you press the rinse button and the machine washes itself. And I don't like to work very much, so I really like that feature. With these two cells, you will find yourself taking them apart to clean them up. So it's a little bit more troublesome. But when you have these challenges, it certainly is worth the effort. Well, how are they working or why do they work? We have basically two windows with a very narrow spacer. And so we have a short optical path length uh, within the system. Well, what happens with a long path length? The nice thing about a long path length is we get to go through a lot of particles. Although if there are too many, we'll have scattering off this particle, this, say this first particle on the left in the middle of the blue arrow, and that scattered light will interact with the next particle, the next particle, and so on before it reaches the detector. And all of those interactions and, and multiple, or really multiple scattering events will start to distort the measured signal as a function of angle. We get around this uh, in a typical measurement by diluting the sample once light scatters off the first particle, the odds of it interacting with multiple particles on its way to the detector is quite low. Well, the other way to do that is to make a very short path length so that the light scatters off of a particle and makes it out of the cell before seeing any other particles. Uh, the trade-off, of course, is that you'll need a higher particle concentration to make such a measurement. But this is a case where we're working with high concentration materials, and so uh, we, we don't mind. So kind of that was that one advance that we have had over the last couple of years that's been showing up as very useful, uh, particularly as people start looking at slurries. Uh, we've gone through tight repeatability, and we can measure a fair number of, of battery type materials fairly routinely. As we move into the future, uh, you know, surface area is important, and people are starting to look at nanoparticles for these battery applications. Um, although I haven't heard of much being done with them commercially yet, although I might be behind the times on that. Um, and as you look at 
these nanoparticle systems, if everything is below a micron, then you can start looking at dynamic light scattering, and you're going to find yourself asking about surface charge, uh, since that will be important in liquid slurries. We have analysis for that as well, uh, dynamic light scattering. Or if you need more details on distribution, or you're looking at particle concentration, we have nanoparticle tracking analysis and the view sizer. I should have made a conclusion, so I apologize. Really, the, the general technique for battery material characterization has been laser diffraction as the workhorse. And so I think I'll leave that comment there. Say thank you very much and solicit questions. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Sergey. Okay, this question came in for someone working on detection of active materials and particle size. What might be a good starter technique? On active materials? Yes, active materials. And this person is working on, on battery, not pharma. Okay, yeah, okay. So you understood my confusion. Uh, yes. So the vast mass majority of battery uh, applications we see wind up with laser diffraction. And, and so just from the industry, I would start looking at laser diffraction and, and then seeing what questions need to be answered. Got it. Thank you. Um, so you guys can also email us at labinfo at hariba.com um, to kind of kickstart the process of kind of asking what, what technique might be a good starter. So this question is for Sergey. Um, is the ramen example of lithium cobalt oxide and oxygen def deficient of lithium cobalt oxide? Does the formation of oxygen deficient phase indicate oxygen formation during cycling? So the ramen can track it down um, changing in, in the lattice or environment. So if you see the changing in the structure, you need to assign certain kind of the peak of vibration. For example, I show the spectra and the two peaks in, in the lithium cobalt uh, oxide can be assigned to the certain vibration of the atoms. So once you change uh, environment, uh, you definitely will change sync and then you can really see if it's oxygen or maybe going out of lithium. Uh, for simple comparison, I would compare the different cobalt oxides and see how they can change it. But if you definitely know that you have different oxygen content in the material, I would take the spectrum, compare and see what would be the difference. And you can really clearly see. Because oxygen is relatively small, is not heavy, uh, it may be changing in a, in a position uh, of the line. And uh, oxygen also may, you may not see oxygen itself, you may see the formation of the carbonate. And then this gives you some indication on uh, some Raman bands, which is like 1096, 1086. And we saw this effect already on the sun, uh, lithium cobalt oxygen material. So cobalt oxygen, uh, uh, lithium cobalt uh, oxygen react with uh, moisture on, on, on the uh, uh, CO2 and creates a carbonate. And this is, you can consider as a, as a losing the, uh, oxygen, but in this case, it will be indication of formation of a carbonate. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Next question is for Jeff. When using a cell with a paste, paste cell, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. When using a cell with a paste, are there any issues with the sample reacting with the cell? And second part to the question is, are cells made with different materials? Yeah. So the cells we offer are glass. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it escapes me what, what, at the moment what grade glass they are. And so the wetted materials would be, uh, for the HL cell, would be glass and either a Teflon or aluminum uh, ring around the cell. And then for the paste cell, it's just the two glass plates. Uh, yeah, so if you have something that's very, very, well, if you have something that reacts with glass, uh, then that will, will, will become a concern quite quickly. Yeah, particularly since we have a high, uh, highly loaded sample. 
but most materials I've seen, we have not had that issue come up. Thank you, Jeff. This one, this question, can you provide more details about controlled environment sample chambers to analyze air, moisture sensitivity, battery materials? I think this is a question for, for Sergey and the mm -hmm. cartridge for the X, XRF. So uh, for, as for Ramon, for example, you can place it in a, in a, in a chamber and putting this uh, uh, dry nitrogen in the chamber and do the measurements inside of the chamber. We usually using some different chambers and uh, you can use it, for example, any kind of a heat and cooling stage, which uh, you can close. In this case, you can avoid any kind of the reaction with the moisture and the water. And then you also can carry the sample to different uh, environment. Now, what I show for the micro XRF, it's a special compartment which you can put your materials in the, in the glove box, then can take it out from the glove box and bring it to the micro XRF system. Then micro XRF working under the vacuum, uh, one of the uh, possibility you can apply vacuum and then you open chamber inside and then you navigate the system to measure something. But again, uh, if you want to really avoid any kind of the uh, reaction with uh, moisture on, uh, on air, or air uh, you have to put it in the, in the compartment. And we do we do have offered several of them for measurements. Great, thank you, Sergey, and thanks, Jeff. <laughs> I would not know. <laughs> okay, this person wrote, "I am most interested in characterizing the surface of electrodes." both before and after cycling. Um, is that an application for Raman, Sergey? Is this... Yeah. Okay. I'll show you an example when you can do the measurements on one slide to show exactly what uh, 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 the person is asking. So here it's, it's a, a before the uh, cycling. As you can see, distribution of the so distribution in A and G band, it's it's actually a ratio, A and to, 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 to E band. So A is red, E it's a, it's a slightly blue. Now, uh, when you're doing after cycling, as uh, a picture has changing dramatically, and you can see the only blue because it's, it's an e, uh, e band and the A band is like really uh, very low. So you, of course, you can do the surface analysis for the uh, uh, of the electrode uh, on our material quite easily using the Raman. And again, uh, it's what we done using the 532 laser and penetration depth on this laser. It's probably uh, slightly less than uh, one micron. If you want to go really uh, surface as a less, I would recommend to use a blue laser or even the UV laser. And UV is very good for this NMC material as well. But in this case, you're getting just only surface for UV laser like C25, you probably will collect the uh, information from the, I would say, 100 nanometers layer on the surface. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think that's about it for today. And I, I want to honor your time and everyone's time too. But thank you uh, for the excellent talks so again, Jeff. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, at labinfo.com. The next webinar is going to be on jet milling and air classification. So if you're up for a little switch of topic, it's going to be on May 17th. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye for now.